Welcome to the 397th episode of the Jamie Delaney Plant-Based Wellness Podcast. My name is Jamie Delaney and I'm your host. I'm a plant-based cardiologist and endurance athlete living in Southwest Florida. Welcome and thanks for listening. It's hot down here, hot running, but um, it's all going well. Next event is the beginning of October, a trail marathon, so I think it's October 2nd, followed by a swim run, so I actually got in the pool for the first time um, in several months. After we finish the swim run, I always say I'm going to run, or I'm going to keep swimming one day or two days a week, and I never do, especially when it gets cool, so I um, haven't been swimming, so I show up, pay my annual pass again, say hello to everybody, and uh, get back in the pool, so It was good. Did about a 45-minute swim, getting warmed up, getting used to it, getting my shoulders back in gear, and it feels pretty good. um, It's funny. It's so hot in Florida that 82-degree pool water feels cold, so it was refreshing. Mango season is coming to a close here in Florida, unfortunately, but we are processing mangoes, and so we end up freezing enough to have for um, hopefully almost to the next mango season. So that's, uh, we're kind of in the processing season. So running in Florida, uh, it's easy to get dehydrated. And this time of year, typically I run in the morning without water. I take Sophie. um, So I don't want to carry anything besides the leash and Sophie's treats. Um, But anything over five, six miles, it starts to get pretty hot. And sometimes I'll even break it up and come back in to get a drink. But um, after that, we start running with some sort of uh, electrolyte uh, drink, and it's just easier to absorb some calories if you're running longer, so we've been using a combination of Tailwind and Gnarly products. Uh, again, I'm not sponsored by each of them, but either of them, but we kind of like the taste, and so the idea is not to get make yourself sick on using one product or another uh, and, get, and get used to it and get some electrolyte, and it does, it does really help. Uh, it keeps you from when you're coming in being famished, so to speak. So that's how that's been going. But, you know, dehydration affects more people than just runners. And it's not just hot in Florida right now. It's hot everywhere. And, you know, I think I made uh, alluded to a person I saw the other week running with a sweatshirt. And I saw him again today, actually, sweatshirt and sweatpants on, um, trying to, I guess, sweat out the, the bad things or sweat off some extra weight, burn some extra calories by being hot. Which you don't advocate because then you're just getting dehydrated. Um, muscle glycogen, um, you keep water with it. So when you sweat and when you burn sugar, you, you, you sweat and you're sweating a lot of glycogen. But at, at this um, temperature, you're also sweating um, a, a fair amount of water. You can weigh yourself before and after and you can get an idea of how much water you actually lose. Um, but nevertheless, even if you're not running, uh, you, can, you can become dehydrated. And most people think of being dehydrated and you you might get a little dizzy or you get a headache, but there's also dehydration more on the cellular level. And so when our cells become dehydrated, um, or actually when we become become dehydrated intravascularly, that's, um, you know, our cells have to keep our blood flowing. So, you know, if you think about, uh, you know, our, our blood carries oxygen and, and nutrients to our body, if that runs dry, then all motion ceases. So we have to keep our vascular system um, hydrated uh, beyond the cellular system. For an extreme example would be if somebody um, uh, had an arterial cut and they lost a lot of blood, their blood pressure drops because they've lost a lot of volume. To resuscitate them quickly, you start pumping in intravenous fluid, saline or a combination of electrolytes while you're waiting on blood so you can maintain flow through the heart. The cells do the same thing. They give up water to the vascular system to maintain a volume status that keeps us upright, keeps our heart pumping, uh, keeps blood flow to our brain. And when that happens... The cell wall, on a chronic basis, the cell wall actually starts to thicken secondary to this dehydration. And there's actually been shown that cholesterol can actually attach to that um, cell wall to help repair it to keep the cell from losing and falling apart, so to speak. So the consequence of that thickened cell wall is that the 
decreases the cell's ability to absorb water itself and nutrients and leads to cellular damage and um, back up all along where whatever cells affected. So in the case of the liver, um, you know, you can get gallstones formation in the gallbladder, biliary stones in the liver, increased lymphatic sludge because you don't have enough fluid to go through. And all that can tend to be reversed with just hydrating, and water is always the, the best source. We don't need food. You know, a lot of times um, people get sick, and the first thing they, you know, it's uh, in our house, it was if you can sit up and take nourishment, everything's going to be okay. And I, and I think innately humans um, kind of do that, that if they can eat then they're going to be okay. And I think as we get older, it's really more important that you can take in food because if you don't take in food, you're not eating, you're, you know, bad things happen. But the reality of it is in the animal kingdom, you know, when an animal is sick, it really um, stops eating and just tries to take sips of water and maintain hydration and lay low until the, you know, whatever disease process passes, hopefully. So we can go a long time without food, but we can't go a long time without water. Our mentation starts to decrease in the elderly population. They become very confused um, quicker than in a younger population, probably because they're baseline somewhat dehydrated to start with. Older people uh, may have trouble with um, urinary incontinence, so they don't drink on a, on a regular basis. Maybe mobility keeps people from drinking all the fluids that they should. People turn to coffee or tea, which can be dehydrating and, and or a diuretic effect. So with uh, chronic dehydration, um, again, de decrease mentation, you start to get a sludge-type formation um, throughout your body, lymphatic system, liver, uh, and, and have you. And so you can see how bad things can happen fairly quickly. Um, and all we need to do is, is to really stay hydrated. There is a case of overhydration um, there, um, where people drink excessive amounts and actually dilute their electrolytes, and so they end up having more water than, than salt, and that can actually cause brain swelling and death. So we typically tell people to drink to thirst is a, a very um, kind of safe way to assure hydration. Of course, urine color being clear, light, um, but again, a lot of people fail to do that or drink in things that they, you know, that aren't really hydrating. Um, fruits obviously have a lot more uh, hydrating ability, fruits and vegetables, than animal products. Um, animal products having fat, fat, oil, and water don't mix together. So fat and animal protein are typically more hydrophobic, meaning they don't have a water associated with them. So the more animal products people eat, the more dehydrated they tend to be on a chronic basis. So you can see how that leads to constipation because, uh, again, animal products um, don't have water with them. There's not fiber with them, so it tends to be sludge forming in the in the in the colon. So along with all this decreased movement of materials, you have a toxic metabolic waste just kind of sitting there oozing back into the bloodstream, which can cause disease. Um, you know, but the, you know, always goes back though. People are worried about, you know, am I getting enough protein? Am I getting enough meat? And, you know, that's, that's what they're always worried about. And the reality of it is probably fruits, vegetables, and water is really the most important things we can do, especially, uh, in the presence of, of not feeling better. So don't worry about, um, the protein. And, and just as an aside, I, I saw a very interesting reference and it makes a, a lot of sense if you, are still doubting, you know, that we need a lot of protein. So in the first year of life, our, our body doubles in size, and of course a lot of organs grow in development, our brain being one of them. And our human breast milk is closely associated to the milk of our primate cousins. And if you look at the composition of human milk, um, it's only 0.8 to 0.9% um protein, 4.5% four, four fat, 7.5% carbohydrate. Um, if you look at primate, it's 0.85 to 1.2, so pretty close. 
Cow's milk, on the other hand, is 3.5 grams of protein per 100 milliliters, so much, much more. If you look at a cheetah, people say they're carnivores. Uh, Cheetah has 99.6 grams of protein per kilogram, uh, which is 10 times that of of human milk. Um, So if our protein requirements in breast milk, I think most people will agree, is the best nutrient for a newborn, uh, certainly in the first year of life. And interestingly, the protein content of milk decreases after about one year. But nevertheless, uh, one, you know, for the first year of life, very low protein, more high in carbohydrates. The most fundamental time of survival, if something bad is going to happen, is if you make it through the first year of life, um, chances start to get really good thereafter that things are going to be good. Um, so why would we be so worried about increasing our protein so much as an adult when all our cellular, all we're, we're full grown, um, we're not developing anymore? Um, so why do we need so much more protein as a percentage of our body or our caloric intake than, than we would if we were trying to double our size? Doesn't, doesn't make a lot of, doesn't make a lot of sense. Um, it's just the effective marketing and and we know that you know excessive protein comes with excessive fat excessive metabolic waste excessive um, bad microbes excessive um, or lack of fiber um, and more acidity so again you know try not to get too focused on you need protein if you're not feeling well you actually need water so if someone has, uh, you know, COVID or a GI illness or whatever they have, the flu or um, certainly any kind of belly ailment, um, they would do best with just drinking water um, for, you know, till everything clears. Uh, if you have a clogged drain in your sink and you keep putting water, let water run down, you don't necessarily have to put Drano, Drano down. But if you kept water flowing, 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 finally you'll clear the clog. And it's the same way with our, our cells and our GI tract, that if you keep water flowing in, um, everything's going to end up being all right. When we look at cardiovascular risk factors, um, everybody turns to um, cholesterol, high blood pressure, smoking, exercise. But cholesterol is, you know, the one that we focus on. seems like it's the easiest to treat, give everybody a statin. Some people say statins should be put in the drinking water um, guidelines, keep lowering the age at which people's cholesterol should be started, it should be checked, and lowering the age that people should be placed on a statin. There are even children that are on statins. Um, We look at cholesterol like it works in a vacuum, that that causes vascular disease, and if the cholesterol is down, then then it's free sailing no matter what we eat. Uh, and, And that's actually not true. And the way that statins work is they decrease the um, ability of the, cholesterol, of the liver to produce cholesterol. So they decrease cholesterol production. But nothing is always is ever one way. We produce and we eliminate. We produce and we eliminate. So why have we focused so much on decreasing the production of cholesterol as, and we never address our people eliminating cholesterol. And I'll go a little bit further and say that we seem to dismiss some organs that we don't necessarily understand, gallbladder appendix being two of them, as unnecessary unnecessary organs that, you know, you get to be 30 or 40 and you might as well get rid of them. But the gallbladder plays a, a, an extremely important role in the elimination of uh, cholesterol and in metabolism. But we're very quick to get rid of it because gallstones form. So we get a metabolic waste accumulation that seems to rear its ugly head in the gallbladder first when people are in their 30s and 40s. So if you look at the decline of an American, we'll say, or the decline of an adult, um, typically uh, people start to become overweight in their 30s and 40s. Now, of course, it's backed up. they women typically have had their kids, so they've had giant weight shifts uh, up and down, the stress of pregnancy, and the next thing you know is their gallstone formation and, and gallbladder attacks, and, and the gallbladder is removed. And it's real simple now. We can put a, put a couple 
tubes in and suck the gallbladder out, same day surgery, you can go home and be on your way and back to normal eating what you want and, you know, no big deal. And most of the people will get their gallbladder taken out after one gallbladder attack. You know, it's like, oh, you've got gallstones when you take your gallbladder out, we'll schedule this for an elective surgery, and you get your gallbladder out and you go on your merry way. Um, but that doesn't seem to ever improve one's ability to digest food. It just causes a whole host of other problems, which may lead to acid reflux or chronic bloating, for which people are placed on additional medications. And, of course, the next thing, lipids start to go up, right? So cholesterol starts to go up, um, sodium retention, um, metabolic waste accumulation, maybe a little bit of uh, thyroid issues. So high blood pressure, cholesterol start to follow pretty closely in the 40s and 50s. So be it, maybe cancer starts to rear its ugly head uh, in people as well. So what's the gallbladder have to do with all this? What does toxic metabolic waste have to do with all this? Well, if you start to think about it um, in our hydration, um, you know, our gallbladder um, and, uh, makes uh, bile and helps us to degrade, to, um, you know, digest our food. But it can be clogged with stones. Um, typically, um, they can have cholesterol in them. They can be bile acid stones, usually a combination. Very, There's usually microbes in there, um, some organic material, but for the most part, they're, they're bile acids. It can also occur in the liver, um, and, and the liver is made up of cavernous sinusoids that drain the bile, as well as blood vessels and, and then the lymphatic systems. Um, and so you can start to get clogging of not only the gallbladder, but you can get stones and, and blockage of the ducts in the liver, and you can't really see them on ultrasound, and you can't really get to them with a a scope through tiny little holes in your belly button. So people take out the gallbladder and the, the, the symptoms seem to settle down for the most part, other than these vague symptoms of indigestion and then abdominal bloating that people get. And then they get diagnosed with irritable bowel syndrome. And turns out that our lymphatic system drain into um, a, a duct uh, that's down in our lower abdomen um, that can can kind of get blogged, uh, blocked up, and, and start to swell and cause some back backwash of fluid fluid around the cells that can cause some of this distension. Um, and and when the when the gallstones start to obstruct bile ducts, obviously there's a decreased blood flow to the liver cells because there's stones that that's kind of smash the the way the blood's flowing. And and again the lymph backs up and. Um, you get this accumulation of foreign material below the level of where things drain into. Well, the liver filters just about everything, and our lymphatics from our lower extremities filter things, and they filter our uh, uh, the backup. You know, our immune system is closely related. So whether it's the tonsils, the thymus, the spleen, uh, the the um, the the colon, all are related into this. Uh, lymphatic drainage and immune system uh, are all kind of hooked together. So gallstones and the microbes associated with them are biliary stones, and the microbes can lead to a chronic chronic source of inflammation. You can take your gallbladder out, but there's still maybe stones, little things stuck in your liver, and again, decreased flow because everything is kind of um, a slow flow state because you're distended and edematous and um, again, it's a chronic form of inflammation. If someone eats a hamburger or a Beyond Burger, um, you actually digest about 15 to 20 percent of that, and the rest of it has to make its way through your colon uh, and your te- and your intestines in your in your colon. And so, the toxic metabolic weight is, waste is still is still hanging around, and all the added chemical ingredients and everything the cows eaten or all the chemistry experiment to make your Beyond Burger is kind of hanging around in your colon for time and, and pushing out and pushing pressure onto your lymphatics. Um, and, you know, it becomes a chronic source of infection. Our immune system control tower is in our, our, our colon. Things get, you know, um, all, all, all hands on deck, so to speak, where inflammation starts. And so when there actually is something for us to fight, we can't really do it. Um, and with the congestion of our cells, you can see how these toxic metabolic waste might ultimately lead to DNA damage and then cancer cell formation. And our body can't handle, uh, you know, usually our immune system is monitoring 
um, you know, our cellular function and gets rid of bad cells and keeps good cells. And, and we have this chronic turnover, but uh, you can see how the system can be overwhelmed when we have this chronic state of inflammation and congestion. And that kind of is driven, you know, when, and when I was in medical school, nobody talked about the lymphatic system and it was kind of, you know, a foo-foo type thing of alternative medicine. Um, but when you start to think about how everything is starting to play out, uh, whether Alzheimer's is a source of inflammation, um, coronary artery disease has a source of inflammation, we know arthritis has a source of inflammation, cancer is the body's immune system not being able to take care of it, it starts to all come together and make much more sense that our gut microbiome and our lymphatic system are just not working together very well. There was a study published uh, in Nature that looked at a trial. Uh, there, there's been several trials, but uh, this one uh, pointed to an Israeli trial. Um, and there was a, another trial in, in the U.S. that looked at fecal transplants. So actually, um, people that were thought to have good gut microbiomes donated stool, which was dehydrated, put into capsule, sounds appetizing. Uh, but it was given to melanoma patients that had a relapse after the immunotherapy, and it showed some great progress. And, you know, this led researchers to comment that, um, you know, what exactly are in these microbes from this fecal transplant that actually help the immune system of a cancer patient to take care of your own cancer. And, and it was stage four uh, melanoma that these people had a response from. So it wasn't just a, you know, a little uh, a tumor that was taken off the skin and nothing else was followed. These people were very sick and they had some response. And so what's in the, you know, what's in the fecal transplants that, you know, what kind of microbes? And so that's, that's certainly being further investigated, but all the researchers came to the conclusion that Obviously, a plant-based diet, a diet high in fiber would feed good gut microbes um, and help the immune system. So, again, I think we're driving it home little by little that a high-fiber plant-based diet is very protective, not only against inflammation and, um, and illness, but in, in cancer and, and helps our body to actually fight off cancers. Our and, and I guess fight off is not even necessarily a good word, but to, to, to function better. Because I think if you look at cancers, it might be that the body's actually not functioning appropriately and some of these cells are trying to work their way out of a bad situation and our immune system can't really help them. A lot of the new cancer therapies are actually aimed at making cancers more visible to our own immune system. So there's been some dysfunction uh, between uh, the cell and the, and the immune uh, system to be able to uh, take care or mend some of these abnormal cells. So, you know, I think it's very hopeful because, again, it comes back to what you can do for yourself. Uh, if we start from the beginning, it's sort of it's being hydrated drinking things that are healthy, um, which, you know, I'll, I'll put it back to water is number one. Um, and, uh, you know, sports drinks and uh, high sugar drinks on a, a lot, you know, a, all the time basis or drinks with a lot of chemicals in them are, are certainly not what you want to do. Uh, you'd like to decrease the metabolic waste or the chemical tops toxins that your body has to deal with. There was a, another recent study looking at uh, BRCA1 and BRCA2 genes, which we um, everybody have heard of BRCA1, BR, BRCA2, being associated with increased risk of breast cancer and ovarian cancer. And those genes aren't bad. It's when those, those, there's actually DNA damage to the BRCA1 and BRCA2 that make them unable to express a protein that's protective to the cell and that's how the cancers are formed but now you know so in the past you know there's been a lot of uh well you need to get your ovaries out if you have this gene you need to get your breast bilateral mastectomies if you get this gene but you know more and more cancers are associated with abnormalities of these particular genes uh, and there was a study looking at um, thousands of cohorts comparing them to control people without the genes. And certainly there are an increased risk of biliary cancers, gastric cancers, esophageal cancer, as well as breast and ovary, prostate cancer, pancreatic cancer. So again, just having organs removed, organs that we may need or use, 
um, because they express an abnormal gene is not necessarily in our best interests. Perhaps we should do what we can to help to repair that DNA or to keep that abnormal DNA from um, being a bad player in our body. So again, things that we can do, maintaining a normal weight, keeping hydrated, eliminating toxins, uh, decreasing metabolic weight, uh, waste products, uh, eating a high fiber plant-based diet are all things that we can do in our control as opposed to being a reductionist type viewpoint, give something targeted, give something that we're just re- keep removing things that actually play a, a role in, in keeping us healthy. I'll even take that all the way back to statin therapy. Um, you know, the first thing we do, you get a blood test, your cholesterol is elevated, um, you get put on a statin. And we'll titrate that to your cholesterol is less than 200. And people that are obviously eating a poor diet, their cholesterol may be very, very high. Um, or it may be the people that can't clear the cholesterol. Their, their cholesterol may be very high. So they end up on a high dose statin. And now um, Crestor Ruvastatin has been associated with a severe risk in kidney damage up to the point of kidney failure and dialysis. So blood in the urine, protein in the urine, kidney uh, damage, disease, and like I said, to the point of kidney failure, um, there was a greater than 8% uh, risk of hematuria, 17% proteinuria, 15% failure versus other statins with Crestor. Um, But again, these weren't zero in these other statins as well. So when we adopt a reductionist type viewpoint that the cholesterol is high so we need to decrease the production maybe just maybe we should start looking at how do we make our bodies able to clear cholesterol better and make our body so that there's not inflammation that um, leads to the overproduction of cholesterol because who knows maybe cholesterol is being produced as a result of an increased inflammatory state and our body's trying to patch things up in the first place so, um, again, I, uh, you know, with all that being said, I have been visiting um, the benefits of potential liver flushes and kidney flushes to see if you can't clear some of this metabolic waste out. In the past, I've talked to Dr. Goldhammer about fasting, water fasting, certainly a way to let your body heal itself, take away the toxins you're certainly um, you know, kind of taking a time out and being mindful, drinking water, uh, keeping hydrated and letting your body heal is certainly an option. But there are some things called liver flushes uh, that, can be, that can be done. Um, and I actually um, uh, did an experiment of, of one, uh, doing a liver flush to see whether or not I could eliminate uh, some liver stones. And, you know, I will say that I did, I'm going to talk more about that in upcoming podcasts, but I believe there's something to it that looking at both ends and not being such a reductionist, looking at the whole body as opposed to, um, just looking at parts. I was, I'm a trained cardiologist. So I looked at the heart, you know, there were times in my career that I said, you know, above the diaphragm, below the neck, that's what I'm interested in. Um, obviously that's not possible things other than above the diaphragm and below the neck affect the heart cholesterol smoking hypertension that those are vascular whole body things that need to be addressed diabetes Um, but when you look at the function uh, of toxins in the body metabolic waste elimination it's impossible to just pick an organ and say that's that's the problem. Everything is, you know, I guess the older I get, the everything is multifactorial. Everything has a backside. So even though Crestor is wonderful at lowering cholesterol, uh, it appears to be um, equally as wonderful at doing damage to the kidneys. We know that all statins increase the risk of diabetes, so they, and they do that by decreasing pancreatic function and production of insulin. So um, there are better ways around um, treating these particular numbers with a particular drug. So um, I hope I left you with hope because I believe that there's a lot of exciting things in the future that you can do on your own to uh, help make yourself healthy, um, none of which involves fast food, junk food, chemical-laden foods. Um, I'd encourage you to go over to the Environmental Working Group. It's ewg.org, and you can look at some of the toxic chemicals 
in foods that you would assume that would be healthy, all the way down to Centrum Silver, Central Central uh, Centrum Vitamins, or Kids Vitamins, and the toxic materials that are associated with them. And you can just you can start to see how we can accumulate toxins as well as metabolic waste from overconsumption. If you'd like to know more about our practice, head on over to drdelaney.com. It's D-O-C-T-O-R-D-U-L-A-N-E-Y.com. And um, check out our website. You can sign up for the newsletter if you'd like uh, to send a question. Uh, you can email me at jamie, J-A-M-I, at drdelaney.com. Uh, again, we're going to be running a race in Stewart, Florida, the Treasure Coast Marathon in March um, with a lot of people. We'd like uh, you to join us. It's Now it's uh, becoming time to start your training to get six months going. And uh, look forward to hearing from you. Yeah, so would Gretchen. Thanks for listening.